All right, what's going on, beautiful people? Welcome back to another Fell into Phenomenal podcast episode. I am your re-entry coach, Coach T for the win. Glad y'all can join us for information, inspiration, and resources on this journey from Fell into Phenomenal. I am so excited. You know, I'm always excited when I have guests. I, I, I had the opportunity of perusing his information and found out that we had a mutual uh as far as knowing some of the same people so i'm glad to be in great company and ladies and gentlemen i'm gonna bring to you mr brandon warren how you doing sir there we go sorry it timed out yes i can hear you i can see you okay cool cool glad to have you on glad you can join me uh it's it was very surprising that i found your information actually your youtube page about a month ago and then I saw your interview with Jesse Payton pop up and yeah. I DJ and I have a great relationship with him. And I put together a little small conference, fell into phenomenal conference and he spoke and uh, it was just a great time. And I just thought it was awesome that you guys knew each other and he offered to connect us. So once again, welcome. I'm glad to have you here, sir. Thank you. Glad to be on. Yeah, Jesse's a, a good guy. We were uh, locked up for a couple of years together uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, he and he was funny even then. Well, that's good to know. I'm glad he turned it into a profitable business for himself. Yeah, and and he's um he's not the only one. So Ali Sadiq is another yeah. guy who spent time in prison. He's out here in Houston. I've never met him. I've not had the opportunity, but uh, he he's went that route. There's a couple of others, but uh, Jesse and Ali are the two that I think of the most out in the Houston area. Yes, you are actually correct. Ali Sadiq actually had um, a special on like Comedy Central where he went into prisons and performed. I thought that was pretty amazing. I had a chance to check it out. Yeah, and we offered uh, Jesse the same opportunity here where I work to go into the prison, but the the warden at that particular unit wasn't really trying to hear it, uh, so we postponed it. But we're on eight different units where I work at, so we can try to get him in here, you know, get him in there and do it again. Uh, so that would be cool. And I, I don't know if we can record it, but that would be ideal. That would be. So, yeah, you mentioned your work. So you did a little time, but now you have been uh, helping with education in the criminal uh, in the prison for like 10, 11 years. Yep. Uh, 11 years now. Yeah. Wow. That's pretty awesome. How did that come about, man? So I spent uh, six and a half years between the ages of 16 and 24 uh, incarcerated. I did. 13 months in juvenile, some time in state jail, and then some uh, four and a half, a little more than four and a half years in prison in between 99 and 2005. Um, when I was locked up, I had the opportunity to enroll in a college program to get my associate's degree. That was the same program Jesse was in. Back then they had something called the Youth Offender Grant that would basically pay for the tuition, the college tuition of uh, youth offenders. They were under like 24 years old. So uh, I racked up a bunch of college hours, and during that time, I just knew that what I wanted to do with my life was come back into the prison and be involved in education. That's just what I wanted to do um, for a number of reasons. One was just I realized that not everybody in the penitentiary had a grandmother like I did. And my grandmother used to send me books. She used to send me information about colleges. Uh, this was, you know, early 2000s, so the internet was, was getting big, and she was scouring the internet trying to find information for me, and uh, I just wanted to serve others like she was serving me and providing me with those kind of educational materials, and, you know, as I began to grow in my own understanding and awareness through education, I just started to see the world differently, and it was, uh, like, irritating to me that that everybody else was still like believing in conspiracy theories and there was all the racism and the violence and so i just decided like i want to be an educator who comes back into the prison and tries to help you know alleviate some of that through quality education so when i got out i finished my uh, bachelor's degree in counseling and when i enrolled in the uh, master's program for a master of divinity in theology like the set like the first semester i was there the, the dean of the school was asked by a, a fundraising nonprofit if the school would be interested in uh, providing a bachelor's degree uh, to people serving time in prison. So that's not something that the school had ever done before. 
but the dean knew that I was enrolled because I wanted to go back into the prison and teach. So he said, so he emailed me and he said, hey, we've been asked to start a bachelor's degree program in a prison. I want you involved somehow to help us. So I was immediately hired and uh, only the dean had anything to do with prisons. None of the other faculty and staff had ever been in the penitentiary, had ever done any kind of prison work. So it was a really uh, unique kind of thing. I had been on parole for like three years. Um, but uh, so TDCJ allowed me in because the, the fundraising group, the nonprofit group that we were involved with, knew all the right people at the time. They knew the governor, Rick Perry. Uh, Dan Patrick, uh, Senator John Whitmire out in Houston, all of those people were supportive of the program. And so when the school said, we want this guy, you know, yes, he's an ex-convict, he's been on parole, we want him to help us. They just said, okay. So I got to start off as a TDCJ, a contract employee of the state, uh, helping as an administrator and adjunct professor for a, a bachelor's degree program. And that's how I got my start back in 2011. Wow, that's pretty amazing, man. We have similarities too, man. I had a strong support system and my grandmother as well enforcing education, which facilitated me getting my bachelor's degree in chemistry. So that's pretty awesome. Oh, a chemistry background. That's, yeah. I mean, that's even more unusual. That's awesome. Yeah, but I wanted to ask with the story you just shared with all those fabulous people, uh, what do you think it was about you that allowed them to invest or, or want to support or wanted to pick you as the candidate to push that program forward? Yeah, one of it was probably just because I don't know that there were any other formerly incarcerated folks in the school that they were aware of. Um, but uh, another was uh, probably my clear uh, desire and ambition to do just that. When I enrolled for my master's degree, I told the dean in the interview that the reason I'm here is because I want to get a good education so that I can go back into the prison. That that was my goal um, because I, I knew that in order to get back into the prison, or at least I thought, like having been to prison myself with felony background, then I was going to need to have some sort of qualified credentials for them to trust me to go back in. And so that was really one of the um, motivators for me to move through the academic world was to have all the right titles and credentials so that people would take me seriously. So when I got enrolled in the master's program, that's what I said. I said, part of the reason I'm here is so that I can get all the right credentials so that I can go back in and teach. And so when they got that email, um, he, he just knew that I was the one he, you know, who needed to help him start that program. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, that mission, that focus definitely helped you. I specifically asked that question because on your YouTube page, I like how you talk about, um, you know, soft skills mm -hmm. uh, and virtues in that area because that's more of uh, my guidance and coaching area okay. for that personal development. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to know how influential was that, uh, do you feel, in that particular process to just be selected? It's um, it's vital. So when I, I did my doctorate of education on uh, intellectual virtues, I did it on moral reasoning, intellectual humility, and open-mindedness of formerly incarcerated folks. I was originally supposed to do a quasi-experimental study inside the prison, um, and I was getting approval from the prison to do that study. It was going to include three or 400 vocational college students, uh, and that's when COVID hit. This was March of 2020 when I was about to get approval, and then everything went on lockdown, and they postponed it. And so I had to convert my original research study into an internet survey of formerly incarcerated folks instead of currently incarcerated. So I did that on um, open-mindedness, humility, and moral reasoning. And in the process of doing that research, I realized that <clears throat> economic researchers, uh, the National Research Council, when they're doing a study of soft skills, the way that they define soft skills is basically the same way psychologists define personality traits. I mean, when you look at the actual definition of soft skills, according to economic research, it is it mimics what psychologists refer to as personality traits, um, which is also very similar to the way philosophers refer to virtues or theologians. So when I started to make the connections between the way that economists were discussing soft skills, psychologists were discussing personality traits, philosophers were talking about virtues, and educators were calling them character traits. And I made all of those connections. Then I began to realize that um, 
number one, it just added a lot of depth and substance to the discussion. Because I think a lot of times when people talk about soft skills, they just suck about like being a good listener or being a good communicator. And the motivation for being a good listener or a good communicator is usually so that they'll make more money. But the motivation, you know, from a psychological or philosophical perspective is because, you know, you are working on things like soft skills and virtues because you want to become a better person. You want to become someone who is productive and successful, not just in making money, but existing in the world as a citizen, you know, as a father or mother, whatever it is. And it was through the economic research that they could put a dollar value on the degree of a person's ability to lead, communicate, uh, you know, listen, be open minded, be honest, be humble. And so that was, you know, that's what people want to hear that isn't as important to me because I'm already sold on the idea that developing character traits and virtues is important, but for like funding and donors and politicians, you know, they want to hear like dollar value. So economic research can show that a person who scores higher in leadership abilities, communicate communicative abilities is going to make more money is going to have more authority um, is going to have is less likely to have mental illness problems uh, is going to have better relationships is less likely to come to prison like all of these different variables um, are much more positive for people who are higher in a variety of soft skills oh man that's awesome that's some good information right there man you even enlightened me a little bit and i would love to uh read your research paper once it's done is it, is it finished already yeah, it's done yeah okay is it accessible online or yeah yeah okay. well it should be accessible on proquest uh, but i could just send you the pdf <laughs> okay awesome yeah i would love to have that so is it doctor now Are we... yeah 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 it's, oh it's... man i'm sorry i don't <laughs> want to say short man you out here yeah. so yeah so with all the titles that you hold can you explain a little bit about uh what do you do as a re re-entry specialist yeah so in 2017 is when i knew that um i needed to move on from that bachelor's degree program and i reached out to the the dean of lee college uh, lee college is the college program that me and jesse payton were involved with uh, and i graduated from lee college when i was still incarcerated and so i reached out to her and they had just been awarded a, a grant a title five uh, grant from the department of education to include a transition specialist that's what they called it and a transition specialist on a regular free world college campus sometimes they're called navigators they help students once they graduate at the associate level to find jobs or move to like the university so they hired me to do that but in the prison context um so this was something that had not been done before in texas yet because the the prison system tdcj historically did not want um the colleges to have anything to do with the students upon release because that was violating the policy of establishing a relationship or whatever and so um there weren't any of the colleges involved in prison they didn't have like alumni groups or re-entry stuff but uh the dean he, she's now the associate vice president uh donna zuniga has been around for, for quite some time she went ahead and hired me and uh, i started doing the work of re-entry tdcj looked at the work they they appreciated what we were doing and then they began to encourage all the other colleges to do the same so college and prison programs in texas that are involved in re-entry is is growing so i do uh two I, the way i see it is two major divisions i have student services so i go into the prisons and we're on uh, eight different prison units one of which is a, a female unit plain state jail over in dayton and um so i go into the prisons i introduce myself I give them um, just different like resources that I created with my address and information, and they can write me about anything reentry related. So if they want to know, they need a list of halfway houses. They need to know what welding jobs are available in Bryan College Station. If they need to know what bachelor's degree programs University of Houston offers, it don't matter. Like whatever they need in terms of reentry, they can they write me. And so for somebody who don't have any family or friends, or they've been locked up twenty or thirty years to be able to write me and ask for that kind of information is, is vital. So I have a lot of stuff that I do on the inside, um, providing resources to those who are currently serving time. But then when they get out, 
they can get in touch with me and they can become involved in the alumni network that I've established. So I do several different things. One, I have a weekly Zoom meeting with uh, formerly incarcerated folks, most of which attended Lee College, but they don't have to have attended Lee College. It's just really anybody getting out, you know, that, I don't know, they need to know like how to get a driver's license or, you know, how to deal with certain parole issues or even relationship issues. It really don't matter. It's just a support group online every Wednesday. Um, and then I have just recently started an entrepreneurship group on uh, Mondays for, you know, uh, formerly incarcerated aspiring business owners and entrepreneurs. But when they get out, um, they'll become involved in that network. And then it'll be easier to like refer them to different jobs, help them find housing, uh, help them get identification if they didn't get it when they got out. Uh, but then it's also a supportive network of people like myself who are not just trying to stay out of prison, but trying to do something positive, either by pursuing higher education or getting involved in the community. So uh, it's, it's quite a few things, but that's sort of summarized version of it. Wow, man, you're doing some amazing work, man. If you need some volunteers over there, please let me let me help. <laughs> let yeah, me. for the for the uh, the network and being involved in the groups. I mean, you already qualify, so you, you want to be a part. Of the and so, um, yeah, anytime. Awesome, definitely. So, um, what was your reentry experience like? Did you uh, was it a long time before you would be able to get gainful employment? Did you struggle with housing or anything like that? Well, I had a <clears throat> I had an aunt who um, was able to help me out in the beginning. You know, when I got my got a I got a job that she got like um, through somebody at her church. They had a job opening. It was minimum wage, part time. Uh, like a warehouse supervisor, not a warehouse supervisor, but a warehouse labor job. Um, so I took it like within two weeks. It was close enough that I could walk. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a bike or anything. Um, so for the first few months, I walked to work for part time minimum wage. Um, but I ended up liking the job and worked my way up. I became supervisor. Just within a year, I became supervisor, you know, made two or three times what I originally started out with. And I was able to get uh, a car, but there are a, a number of things that I encounter that it doesn't matter how much time has gone, how old the crime is, what my education looks like, what my accomplishments are. When it comes to housing, th those people don't care, <laughs> you know, an apartment complex or a trailer park or rental homes. Those people don't care about what your accomplishments or your education is. All they do is they just run a background check and they look at your criminal history. And then, you know, you're more than likely going to get a no unless you somehow uh, are able to sweet talk them. So housing in Texas, at least, is much more difficult than even getting a job. Yes. You know, there's a lot of jobs that are available. They may not be jobs you like or want. There's a lot of jobs actually available. But housing is, is, is hard. And just recently, so I had problems getting car insurance. You know, I called Geico and Progressive and all of them and Allstate. They would not insure me. Because I had a felony, I didn't, um, I had felonies involving a car. I had a stolen car. I had and another one I got arrested in the car. And so those, they considered those moving violations and didn't want to insure me. Uh, I ended up getting car insurance through State Farm uh, because the, the insurance agent like went to AA meetings and stuff. So he had kind of a rough background. So he was like, you know, I'm going to look out for you. Um, so I stayed with him for 11 years just out of loyalty for helping me out. Um, but just recently with COVID, uh, I tried to get life insurance. It was the same thing. If you have a family oh, yeah. background, they either don't want to insure you or you're going to have to pay a higher premium. Same thing for homeowners insurance. They didn't want to get any homeowners insurance um, or they wanted it to be more expensive. So it's just things you never even thought of. Everybody knows about the job. And then secondarily, they might know about housing, but I couldn't do, I couldn't get involved in like Sunday school stuff for my daughter. And I didn't even have sex crimes or children's crimes i have robbery and drugs but i could not get involved with the sunday school stuff with my daughter so this is stuff that you don't even think about um could could affect you so i've been pretty successful because i just brush it off and, and figure out a way to get around it um but if a person is easily defeated you know they're not um perseverant strong-willed then it's very discouraging
Oh, definitely, man. I can definitely resonate with that life insurance uh, issue. I just had that, just got my rejection letter and I was just blown away. Um, so with that, had you looked into getting anything expunged or sealed? Is that an option for you? I mean, you know a lot about that in, in Texas, how that works? Well, for the expungement is usually for lesser than felonies. Um, and for sealing like my juvenile record, um, it, like me working in the prison system, it don't matter if I had it sealed, they was going to find out anyway, because there's only so much that a seal would actually do depending on the job. But it hasn't held me back. I even looked at pardons, but a pardon isn't even um, like full forgiveness. Like even if you had a pardon, you couldn't own a gun. Um, you know, we can vote in Texas when we're off parole, but uh, even a pardon doesn't completely alleviate the negative consequences. So it hadn't held me back in any significant ways. And now it's just part of my identity. Part of what I do is I have a background and I help others who are in the same or similar position. So I'm not worried about it. But um, for other people, if they have like a string of misdemeanors or lesser felonies, like maybe state jail felonies, expungement could be an option. Yeah, man. Resilience is the name of the game. Yeah. So in, a, in addition to your reentry journey, what did you find like most supportive or most hurtful? Uh, or my, you know, might have deterred you uh, slightly through it, during that process. Yeah, well, I guess what is the, I mean, hurtful, I deal with it even now. And I, I have a, we, we just hired a, a new person. Uh, he's, he's around here somewhere. He's a, he served 25 years in prison. He just got out last year. And uh, we hired him to help as a reentry specialist also. And, um, and so to see what he's going through now, what I was going through 15 years ago, is you just get overwhelmed with, technology, you know, emails, phones, um, different kind of emails, spam, like it just the internet and technology, um, everything you do now, especially because of COVID, like COVID just like put everything online, like things that were maybe slowly going to be online, COVID just pushed everything online. And so for somebody getting out now, if you serve a couple of decades, then technology is just overwhelming. It's just fast paced, you know, traffic. Right? Um, so just there's just a lot of uh, responsibilities and depending on how long you served in prison or when you went to prison because i went to prison as a teenager and so when i got out i was 24 and i should have already known a lot of things that an adult person should know but i but i didn't and um so i had to it was it was difficult you know trying to get a full-time job and then going to school and it was it was just overwhelming um but the positive thing I think now is knowing other people like me because I'm still in touch with like a dozen people. We were actually incarcerated together like Jesse. I'm still in touch with like a dozen people. We were all incarcerated together. And so kind of knowing like, what they're going through, we're all going through it together. That was really helpful. And so most of those dozen people that I know, we're all doing well. You know, two of my friends just recently sold their business for millions of dollars. You know, Jesse, you, you know, Jesse, he's successful. He's off the charts. Um, so most of those dozen people who are so that I know we're all doing really well because we stayed in touch and, you know, we were all helping each other through what we were dealing with. Awesome, man. You touched on a great point with that community piece. And it's crazy how in some instances it could be against the law for, um, you know, us to even be in, in a the same space, but it, it's so important for us to have people with the like similarities uh, or situations to know that they overcame it for support. Yeah. So, uh, man, you've been laser focused like throughout your whole time, you know, with reentry and going to school like that. And I saw your video on YouTube about goal setting, and, and that's that's really important. Can you share some tips for uh, you know people on their journey fell into phenomenal with goal setting and you know just being focused. Yeah, I mean, if I remember what I, one of the things I was saying there, so I talk about goals when I do a reentry class. We start off with goals. And the way that I um, try to do it is for them to think big. I tell them to think like the end of your life. Like, what do you want your life to have stood for? That's good. Uh, what do you want on your tombstone? And how you want your family to remember you? Think like that. And once you sort of imagine what that looks like, then you can back up and back up and back up until today and so the way i do it when i'm talking to the guys and, and the, the women in prison is 
you know, imagine what that looks like when you die, what your legacy, what you have stood for, what you, what people will remember you by. And then what can you do, you know, uh, over the next 10, five to 10 years to work toward achieving that, whatever it is, you want to be a family person, you know, you want to own a business, you want to own land, you want to um, write a book, you want to be a musician, you want to be a bodybuilder, like whatever it is, like think outside the box. Don't just think, I want to make a bunch of money. Okay, cool. Who don't? <laughs> like, okay, does. Right. Well, think outside the box, you, you know, you want to be an artist or whatever a scientist or go into the STEM field. Like so many people with felonies are not going into the STEM field. So what can you do over the next five to 10 years to become that, you know, it, you know, it could just mean being a great father, you know, or mother. Uh, once you, you sort of work that out, then back up, what can you do in the next one to two years upon release from prison? So, you know, if you want to do a PhD, let's say, then, you know, you need to within a year or so get enrolled in a school. Um, figure out how online uh, education works. If you one day want to own property, well, then what you need to be doing in the first year or two is start savings accounts, uh, start understanding what is necessary in order to build up your credit so you can buy property. Um, and so then once you sort of figured that out, then you back up, what do I need to do within the first few months to a year of release? You know, I need to get all my identification. Uh, do I need to get a passport? Do I need to start checking and savings? Um, do I need to enroll in school, enroll in the gym, take some extra classes in the computer, uh, you know, computer literacy. So the way I see it is that they need to start at the end of their life and walk it back to today. And then what do I do today to meet the goals for next year, the next five years, and the end of my life? Um, and not everybody thinks that way. Some people, it's part of their personality to think like that. And other people, it's not. It don't have nothing to do with their education or intelligence. It's just some people just don't think in that way. Um, but people who are successful in many areas, they generally do that by setting goals. It's very clear. They know exactly what they need to do. It doesn't just happen, you know, um, like success doesn't just happen to people unless they were born in it. Um, but most people have to set goals and work hard towards it. Man, that's some good information right there. I support all that. I'll have to learn that on my own journey. So, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it for me. I got one last question, and then I'll let you go, man. I appreciate you once again. So with all that you've experienced and that contributed to who you are today, uh, would you change anything? I mean, all of that. You know, it made me who I am today. I think probably if I were going to change something, you know, if I were to say something to who I was as a younger person, um, I would have gotten more focused, uh, more involved in education earlier, pay attention to it. You know, you don't do pay attention to nothing in high school when you're running the streets. Um, you know, it's led me to become who I am today, and, and I really am content with what I'm doing today. Uh, helping others. So if there were anything that I would change, I would just uh, encourage myself to get involved in education and really understand the educational process better. Wow. Um, you know, looking back, there were a lot of things I could have done that people who were wealthier or more privileged, that some of that stuff just sort of came, uh, was placed in front of them in ways that helped them become successful. Uh, I know that now. I didn't know it then. It was just a hard road. So if I hadn't changed anything, I would just encourage myself to be more involved in, in pursuing education. Um, but what I've been through, uh, you know, it's, it's helped me identify with most other people. Mo most people in the world deal with suffering and, and, and pain. So it's not unusual. Um, and it's something that uh, makes us stronger and makes us more relatable to others. I love that answer. I love that response. And I asked that question. That was more for uh, the youth that that uh, I follow, I mean, that follows me, you know, as far as to try, make, start making those adjustments now, you know, because I know just as you, um, I agree that uh, everything has happened for a reason and has made me the person that I am. Had I not experienced X, Y, and Z, I can't say that I would be uh, this person today. Yeah. So um, I think that's very important. And thank you for your time, man. Just stay on the line real quick. I'm going to end the recording. I need to get that information for you. I uh, appreciate y'all for listening. And like I always say, forget society and forgive yourself and go from felon to phenomenal. Yeah, thank you.